here we go. So the basic uh, idea of this talk is to interrogate the, the analytic of uh, inequality and equality critically, since it's central to this uh, summer school. Um, and, and to think about what are the limitations of this way of, of, of studying uh, social and ecological problems, and what can we do about those limitations um, as researchers, but also as political subjects. Um, and I would say, uh, you know, being a researcher is to be a political subject of a special kind, uh, no matter whether you take that responsibility upon yourself or not. Um, anyway, so I, I divided my talk into four different parts. Um, Inequality, exploring that concept a bit. Uh, capital as a driver of inequality. Labor as uh, ultimately the producer of capital. And strategy, both, both how we think about strategy more broadly and how we uh, use our research in a strategic way. Sadly, as, usu uh, as, as usual, the good stuff is at the end. And we're probably going to focus more, have more time for that in the discussion than in the talk itself. So, inequality, part one. I don't know where this is supposed to, there we go. Okay, so um, first I would argue that inequality research has become a hegemonic form of critique, both in the sense that it's, it's, it's pretty dominant among people who think critically, uh, but also in, in the sense that it plays a role in a certain hegemonic configuration of of the management of global capitalism that is a kind of critique that's often quite safe, the way that it's presented. Um, and one of the reasons why this is the case, and one of the reasons why we people who think critically have to, uh, we can use inequality, of course, but we have to think beyond it as well, is that it's normatively, theoretically, and strategically inadequate to the challenges that we face. All right. So, now I'm just going to go through a quick, quick succession of examples of how inequality is used. That I mostly like, actually. I don't have a problem with it, but I want to talk about its limitations. So we all know discussions of the 1%. Here's a couple of graphs from Piketty. Um, we're all familiar with that. We're probably all, most of us, familiar with this graph from Oxfam that shows how the richest 10% in the world are responsible through the consumption for uh, whopping 49% of CO2 emissions. Um, and we can also look at it in terms of countries and, and geopolitical regions, uh, historical emissions, how uh, massively uh, uh, the global north out, out, outweighs, outweighs the global south. Um, and China looks pretty big, but if you consider the population of China, it's, uh, it's relatively a lot smaller still than the EU or the US. Um, and then we have something like this, which talks about how, as there is a relative convergence, which doesn't mean that there is no longer very severe inequality between geopolitical regions in different countries, there is a, a tendency towards convergence um, and which, which, which means that basically there is a, um, a tendency to in, uh, inequality within countries playing a bigger role in uh, CO2 emissions than inequality between countries. I would love to hear Max's critique of that because I frankly just pulled this up as a way to illustrate how inequality is being used. I don't have a specific opinion about the solidity of this data. So... Here we go. We also have international organizations like the IMF, the OECD, and the World Bank uh, having special focus sections on inequality, trying to address inequality in various ways in terms of uh, the pandemic and health, uh, in terms of uh, the equilibrium and social stability of, of, of social formations, etc. Uh, so they, they're saying they're trying to do something about this, and you could say, you know, they're just paying lip service to inequality. But would they be able to pay lip service to class struggle? No, right? Because inequality is a less offensive term than class struggle. To take one example. Like, it's, it, it's one that is relatively less uh, challenging to a certain way of understanding the world. Why is that? So, basically, the critique of inequality 
tends to, which means not in all cases, but tends to contrast facts with norms. So our norm is that everyone should be equal, but in fact they're not. Okay, let's show this, right? Um, we, it gives a lot of work to academic researchers, think tanks, and NGOs to say like, okay, let's do the research. Oh, turns out there's a lot of inequality. That's bad because we all know uh, inequality is bad for various reasons or unjust, or unfair, whatever. It addresses all sorts of uh, quantitative imbalances that you can measure, like on income, for in income levels, for instance, or CO2 emissions or whatever, but it doesn't tend to address the causes. And it's based on a received notion of equality as, as what would be fair. But which notion of equality is the question. So, very brief on the philosophy and history of equality. I'm an intellectual historian, so they don't allow me on a stage without speaking a little bit about the, the history of a concept. I'm also a sociologist, political ecologist, so I'm going to get to that later. But uh, So, ideas of inequality and equality historically emerge simultaneously. Uh, and they have to do with uh, the, the formation of hierarchies is at the same time the formation of demands for equality as well as um, govern, government through equality such that you have different populations who are ruled, but at least they have all the same rights. It could be within a certain class. Everyone in the aristocracy is equal because they all have certain privileges and rights. Uh, or it could be spread out toward a wider part of the population, but within the overall hierarchical structure of monarchy, for instance. Uh, and you have the development of different con concepts of equality, the equality of subjects under the king, uh, which can be within a class or within the whole population, equality of rights, equality of opportunity, and the, which is the more kind of a more contemporary uh, since the 19th century uh, liberal notion of equality and then equality of wealth or equality of power, which is the more kind of left-wing approach to equality. So the philosophical form of equality in all these cases tends to be the same. You have a bunch of subjects, all these dots in the bottom, or citizens, or voters, or whatever, who are in a, on a level playing field. And they, they in, according, in, in accordance to some measure, which is how many rights do they have, or what kind of income do they have, or whatever, that's like there's a norm and the measure, and then you have, you have uh, you have all the different subjects. And in relation to that, there's some kind of higher, uh, higher um, subject that's supposed to guarantee this, like the sovereign, uh, that's supposed to guarantee that all commodity owners can exchange as equals in the market like this through money in a way that's, in a way that's fair and doesn't advantage any one over the other. Um, so there's a guarantee. So... All this is, is like, you'll find it, that abstraction tends to be, uh, sorry, uh, the norm of equality tends to be extremely ex abstractive, which means that it abstracts from the difference between people, it abstracts from the connections between people, and it abstracts from contradictions within the system, and it abstracts from sy sy uh, system itself, apart from this abstract form. Um, so I have a little quote here from Marx in the critique of the Gotha program, which I think is useful, which is, right by its very nature can consist only in the application of an equal standard, but unequal individuals, and there would not be different individuals if they were not unequal, which means we're, we're different, like reducing us to the same measure is an act of abstraction. This um, unequal indi individuals are only measurable by an equal standards insofar as they're brought under an equal point of view, for instance, money or the law, and are taken for one side only. For instance, in the present case, uh, which is his critique and certain, certain idea of socialism as everyone getting according to the labor contribution, they're regarded as workers and nothing more as workers, right? So this is one idea of socialism he criticized. Every worker is equal insofar as they get the same according to one hour is worth so and so much, which abstracts from everything else they are as human beings, including what needs they might have if they're 
uh, disabled or uh, specifically gifted and they need a specific instrument to exercise their gift or whatever. Um, so just to expand on this a little bit to try to illustrate, and now it's getting a little bit uh, too complicated uh, perhaps, um, but um, sorry. You, you can replicate the structure on many different levels. It goes with, it's basically the commodity form, if you're a Marxist. You can talk about subjects, voters. Uh, you can talk about uh, commodities. You can talk about uh, whatever it is that you need to equalize countries, and et cetera. And that abstracts from a lot of other things that these are. These are a lot of other things that you abstract from. At the same time, you abstract from the way that all these are interconnected and interdependent. In complex diagrams, this is just to take an example, this is David Harvey's diagram of capital and capital reproduction. Totally, it's extremely complex. And what happens here, the equalization, is only a part of that. Here you have a, uh, a, a diagram of uh, social ecology. I don't remember where I took that from, sorry. But just to give you a sense of, of the kind of complex, complexity you abstract from when you uh, talk about equality and equality according to just one measure. Um, all this might be pretty obvious to a lot of people, um, but it's still, it's still it's important to speak about because we tend to easily be sucked into discussions of equality and inequality in a way that leaves us being merely knowledge producers and perhaps participants in a discourse about fairness, which does not address all the reasons why people would want to build something like transformative power together. Uh, and uh, wait, I'm going to rewind a second because I should like. Here, here you have the systems that produce not just inequality, but that has this process of equalization according to the law or according to commodity exchange, etc. Abstracting from that, you abstract from what drives the production of e equality or inequality within the system. Right? You don't have a theory of what generates the problem. You just have a notion of, of the problem, which turns out to be just a symptom. So when you do that, you can have a discursive critique of inequality uh, that refers to a certain norm, the norm that we just showed before how it works, uh, which is based a norm that's based on equivalence. And this might undermine people's consent in the way the system is working, but it's not giving any tools to think about how to challenge coercion as a, as a form of power, nor the mute compulsion of the market. Right? So, in order to do that, we have to talk about uh, what are the drivers of inequality, but also we have to, to go back here, we have to talk about the connections between people that are, um, that are, uh, that are abstract, abstracted from in the discourse of equality, which is in, in, in the sense of the, in the French terms, it's fraternité, which is brotherhood, let's say solidarity to be a little bit more inclusive. Um, so if you have a notion of equality that's based on the actual production of solidarity, then you have a completely different conception of equality. But usually, because there is such poor uh, generation of solidarity, and we as social scientists don't connect to that often, what we get is this abstract, separative notion of equality, equality without fraternity. And we're also missing the concept of liberty, which is people wanting to break out of the system of submission, rather than just being equal to the law. It, freedom in its radical sense is also a certain level of autonomy to break out of this. This is the danger of speaking of equality without without solidarity and, and freedom. Okay, so let's then talk about capital as the driver of inequality and, and, and how there are problems with capital beyond the production of inequality if we don't make that uh, our sole um, standard of critique. Um, 
So PKT, who is generally on the, on, I wouldn't say the bad side, but, but the in inadequate side of the critique of inequality, he has this, you're probably familiar with this, uh, uh, function uh, that, pr that basically describes the production of inequality, which is that when the rate of return of capital, R, is higher than, the, than G, which is the general growth of the economy. And Piketty says, this is a normal state of capitalist economies, which is only interrupted by uh, depression, war, and different state measures that often initially develop in relation to depression and, and, and war. So it's basically the mid-20th century period where there was this uh, severe decline in inequality in certain parts of the world and not between parts of the world, as, as Max would remind us. We're talking about uh, Western Europe, we're talking about uh, the United States, we're talking about in a very different way uh, about uh, the socialist states as well. So, Piketty's strategy is to achieve an equalization to uh, decrease the rate at which capital grows in, uh, in comparison to the rate of growth in the economy in general, uh, in order to have an equality of opportunity uh, by different means, building consensus, working through political parties and trade unions, scandalizing in this discursive way inequality. And like it says, quite, uh, quite, quite uh, honestly, he is not proposing full equality. There will be a lot of inequality. But progressive taxation would make a big difference. The general idea is that not only the children of wealthy parents can create companies and participate in the economy. And this is often the ultimate horizon of the critique of equality is simply to level the playing field to redistribute the social product of a destructive social formation, as we'll see right now. So Marx, he doesn't just have a function to describe inequality. He has a theory of how it happens. And he says this is the basic function of the labor process. Uh, it's basically the exploitation of labor. Um, the, the exploitation of labor means that there will be no labor employed unless capital can earn a greater sum of money through the sale of the products of that labor than they had to invest in buying the labor in the first place according with, along with the raw materials and machines needed to produce that labor. The M, the M, the money at the end has to be bigger than the money in the, in the, in, in, in the beginning. And that only happens to the extent that labor is able to produce a surplus. Otherwise, people are not uh, hired. There'll be surplus population. Max was talking about this. And they will be so desperate that they, they will be willing to work for lower wages and then might be a situation where they can be hired in some cases. Uh, and per, uh, profitably employed. So this is very clear. This is one side, but it's only one side of, uh, of the equation, which is uh, labor, L, is, has to be paired with the means of production. Means of production are ultimately products of nature. It's, it's the energy that goes into running a machine. It's the metal of which the machine is built. It's all the raw materials that go through the machine or through the hands of labor. Um, and capitalism requires that this grow, like capital is only invested insofar as there is a profit at the end of the day and as an aggregate system, it requires growth, right? Capital enters into crisis if there is not growth of capital. Um, not necessarily growth of the social formation as a whole, you can also just have growth that's based on predation of the working classes for a certain period of time. Uh, but there has to be capital accumulation or the, an expanded reproduction of capitalism, which is what means that capitalism spreads into more and more spheres of life, spreads to more and more parts of the globe. Sorry if this is very basic, but I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an important stepping stone for the, for the kinds of arguments we have to be making. So, talking about the means of production is, it's as, as, uh, as the products of nature, and I'm not so happy with the concept of nature. It's, it's kind of, you know, we can have a, another discussion of that, but we're talking about 
We're talking about materials, material flows. We're talking about ecologies, different species. We're talking about a whole bunch of things under that heading. And, um, and basically, capital requires the expanded, not just exploitation of labor, but the expanded uh, extraction from nature, which is the destruction of ecologies uh, and, and non-ecological uh, material uh, life and, and um, existence. And here, for political ecologists, uh, one or two very well-known quotes, I think, from, uh, that are worth... Uh, I'm just going to read the last part of the first one. Capitalist production only develops, the te te uh, only develops the technique and the degree of combination of the social process of production by simultaneously undermining the original, original sources of all wealth, the soil, and the worker. So, here's a part conclusion to this section, which is that um, when we document inequality, we measure distribution, but it doesn't explain distribution. Uh, capitalism is an engine of expanded exploitation of labor and the destruction of ecosystems. And three, the distribution of the fruits of capitalism or taking over its productive apparatus does not per se ecologize the way we produce and the way we reproduce ourselves. So we need to address the capital labor question in a way that integrates the ecological question from the beginning. And now I'm interested in how much... Time I've spent, okay. So, I'm gonna jump to part three, labor. And I'm gonna introduce uh, a fun concept, the concept of batshit work. But first, I'm gonna say a little bit about why we need to move from abstract to concrete labor. So we've talked about abstract labor in the sense, you remember the diagram I had before, all the little dots next to each other and they're compared by means of money, right? That's what happens in the process of exchange there is a de facto, in practice, comparison without anyone doing it, a mental calculation necessarily, but there is a de facto uh, comparison happening whenever, whenever there's a choice where to buy from. The, the labor of that, produ that goes into the production there, the labor that goes into that production there is compared. And you say, well, this is a better deal than that, which means that you, you, say this, um, you, you set the standard for, uh, for labor, um, on the basis of what of the product you choose, and there's a market signal sent to the other that the labor costs were too high, for instance. Right? So you have, you have a de facto comparison of labor, an equalization. This is abstract labor. Um, but the pandemic and climate change have forced us to ask a different question. Not abstract labor, which is also questions of how much do you get paid, how many hours do you work, but the question of concrete labor. What labor must be suspended to avoid disaster and what labor must continue? What labor must be suspended to avoid disaster and what labor must continue, right? This is not a question of equality. It's not the question of all labor is, is, is fine, we just need to have equality. No, the question is some labor shouldn't happen uh, for a period of time because everyone will get sick in that work, workplace, for instance. Or forever, because everyone, including the planet, will get sick if we, start, if we continue pumping up oil. So, in the years to come, the debate about green transition will continue to intensify the question of the abolition or transformation of carbon jobs and the character of work in an ecological transition. So, sorry to come back to Marx. <sighs> Labor must be broken down into its twofold form. On the one hand, into concrete labor in the use values of the commodity, and on the other hand, into socially necessary labor as calculated in exchange value. So, just, just to expand the, uh, what I was talking about just before. So, on the one hand, you have, you have quantity, the abstract, undifferentiated expression in terms of money, and on the other hand, you have quality, which has to do with the division of labor the life tasks of the workers, another concept he uses, uh, like concrete skills and, which he doesn't talk about really, but like what, what, are the, what are the materials you work with, what are the toxins, how do they affect the body of the worker or the environment, etc. Like 
there's a use value and there is also the harm value, if we can call it that, of the production process of, of concrete labor. So focusing on concrete labor is not a new thing, but it's, it's, it's a thing that we, the trade unions don't tend to do much. Um, but there are examples of, of, of people doing that throughout the history of capitalism, which is, for instance, the struggles of artisanal workers, demands for meaningful work, uh, then there's a question of workers' pride in the social value of their work or in the, in the exercise of the skills. Then you have feminist demands for the recognition of unpaid reproductive work, which is this illustration here. Uh, then you have a new discourse of knowledge work as immaterial labor, where you focus, on the, again, on, on, on a certain kind of concrete quality of, of the work. And, uh, and a newer... Uh, eco-feminist or materialist eco-feminist discourse around earth care labor as, a, as survivance, which means survival and living beyond mere survival, uh, in a way that's aligned with natural ecologies. Uh, I hope you're, you're familiar with the work of Stefania Barca, the book Forces of Reproduction. I really recommend that on, on this question uh, if, if you don't already know it. So, all these examples of valorizing concrete living labor as meaningful, necessary, and potentially liberating, but of course also oppressed in various ways, non-recognized, uh, exploited, but as something that needs to go on no matter if we have capitalism or not, right? This is the this is a work in excess of the abolition of labor. Well, or you, you abolish wage labor, but you still have to do this work, you still have to care for one another, you still have to care for the world we live in. Uh, we still have to have intellectual production, cultural production, etc. cetera. Uh, oh, need to, I don't know, but we want to. Probably both. So, batcher jobs, which is a, which is a concept that, that I've developed uh, since a few years, um, is different than that. Batcher jobs are jobs that do participate in labor processes that do objective harm to bodies, ecologies, environments. And that also has the potential at least to produce objective disaffection, shame and disgust with what, what you're participating in. Uh, this is a picture from uh, Porto Maghera in the 70s in Italy where workers had to quickly escape their chemical factory because there was, uh, there was uh, an, an uh, surplus emission of sulfuric acid, I think, which was, uh, meant that they had to flee. And there was a lot of struggle against noxiousness in the workplace. Um, worker poets writing about how they see birds falling from the sky, how it affects the neighborhood next to the port, and so on. There's this history of worker struggle uh, against toxicity that we can talk about. So when I say batcher jobs, I'm riffing off the concept of bullshit jobs, which was developed by David Graeber, the anthropologist, that you probably are familiar with this, uh, bullshit jobs as meaningless jobs. Pointless, unnecessary, pernicious. Jobs that can't be justified, even by the employee. But you just feel to ha you have to do this in order to make the case and pretend that it's not bullshit. Bad shit jobs. Bullshit is just, you know, nonsense, right? Bad shit means insane in, in American slang. Jo these jobs are insane in the sense that... In order to make a living, you have to participate in undermining the conditions of life. That's insane, right? That if you have a job where you have to participate in undermining the condition of life in order to make a living. And many workers are aware of this. This is a quote from a, an ex-coal miner in West Virginia. Uh, and I can't do the, the, uh, the dialect, but, but I'll just read it out straight. Uh, there's this misconception, especially with the all in the liberal media, that this 90% of people are just ignorant about climate change, ignorant about the effects of mountaintop removal and all the health effects. Keep in mind, we're the ones getting cancer from the coal mining practices, not y'all, so we can kind of speak on the matter. Um, so, it's just a very quick list of destructive industries, and we can, we can, uh, we can debate whether the list ever stops, even if we start with the bad, uh, it, we might never, never get fully to the point of the totally unicorn harmless, I don't know, but within a capitalist economy, I mean. 
So all oil, coal, and gas mining, fossil infrastructure construction, the airline industry, industrial agriculture, ocean freight, the auto industry, construction sector, the way that it's usually carried out, uh, concrete-based and so on. Marketing is a way to sell the lifestyles that go with this kind of economy. Training petroleum geologists. But many other kinds of jobs participate in securing the expanded reproduction of capital, including education, right? It being here together, it's pretty CO2, let's say, uh, inoffensive, right? Uh, being in universities, working in universities, we don't, we don't need a lot of machinery and a lot of different things. We just have buildings that can stand for a certain number of years that need to be heated, etc. But education itself doesn't seem like a bad job. But if we're educating people to participate in the reproduction of the fossil economy, we're reproducing the conditions of destruction. We're part of reproducing undermining the conditions of life, if only indirectly, in order to make a living, okay? So, we all have to ask what we're doing in this day and age. Um, so, an ecological perspective of, of, on, um, on batshit job could be not just that it has to be an immediate harm, but it participates in a system of reproduction that is destructive, harmful, unsustainable. And let's take the case of guano mining. Guano is a, is a shit of birds and bats that was adopted in order to produce not just uh, fertilizer in Europe in the 19th century, but also gunpowder. Uh, and it was mostly mined in, on the west coast of, of South America and, and on different islands in that region. Uh, and it's a natural product, right? So you would think, well, this is totally nice and sustainable. You have the birds that keep shitting. But if we take the, the kind of... Uh, Fantastic account of the guano trade by Gregory Cushman. He's saying, by jumpstarting these revolutionary trends, the exploitation of Peruvian guano and nitrates during the guano age played a supremely important role in bringing an end to the ecological old regime, which was you only get the nutrients that you can get locally in order to grow agriculture where you're at, to a new regime that was uh, based on the global and colonial trade of, of, uh, of, um, of uh, nutrients for crop production um, in a way that created the condition for the replacement of a new industrial order based on throughput. So it creates a situation where farmers get used to just importing nutrients and producing in a way that doesn't think about crop rotation, that doesn't think about uh, manure, that doesn't think about different ways of working organic matter into the soil locally which creates a condition for, uh, for basically a metabolic rift. So, even work on natural and renewable materials can be bad shit if it facilitates the breaking of nutrient cycles, the widening uh, of metabolic rifts. And in this case, it's neat because it's literally bad shit uh, that they're mining uh, and bird shit. So, I, I kind of mentioned this already. Uh, disaffections of workers against noxiousness. Um, here are some poems from uh, a, the worker poet I mentioned before. I'm not going to read it because I think it, it will. No, maybe it's good with a little break. Uh, I'll take the the last the last answer. Enough with the emphysemas, with the intoxications, with the systematic silent destruction. Enough with this atrocious war waged in the factory in the name of humanity, of progress, of love. Enough. Our blood is fed up. And this speaks to some of the contradictions of bats, bat shit work, which is, there's a war, there's a war in the world upon which we depend, in the name of humanity, progress, even of love, like, well, why do you go to work, work that destroys, uh, destroys, the, the local environment, well, out of love of my family, I have to feed my kids, right? It's a work of love. There's a lot of contradictions here that we need to face, uh, that we can start to face if we talk about concrete labor. And if we go beyond the abstractions of, of abstract labor and of equality and equality. Uh, another disaffection, Fridays for Future. I, I would propose we uh, think of this as 
the struggle of future workers, which in many cases people self-consciously think about this in terms of they want to change the curriculum in order to use something, that is, learn something that's useful and refuse to participate in, dis, in destructive jobs in the future, the self-educating themselves in and for struggle, and uh, people are more and more seeking to, uh, to learn uh, jobs that will be meaningful, so not bad shit, care work, uh, earth care work, um, political work, and uh, the production of, other, uh, of technologies that are not or less harmful, uh, etc. So this is something that we as students have to learn from in each other. How do we maximize our, what we do in that direction? As, and as educators, we, we need to facilitate that. We need to facilitate that to the maximum, which is not just designing the curriculum in the classroom to do that, but also encouraging our students to go out in the world and work with social movements and social initiatives that do this, but also fight with university administrations and fight with uh, ministries of education in order to change the way education is organized and prioritized. Uh, here's another example of people phasing off batch of jobs. So, uh, Lucas Aerospace was a company in the 70s in the UK that was producing armaments, like this tank here, and they were going to be closed uh, or downsized, it wasn't clear. And then they started a campaign with some academics helping them to think about what else could they produce in the factory. For instance, tractors, uh, and, and basically had a campaign for the transformation of the workplace. I have a contemporary example of that in a few minutes. Um, When we get to all these like really meaningful, concrete things, how are we affected with what we do? How do we have cognitive dissonance when we do something we know is privately necessary for us to do that work, but it's also really harmful? Um, when we think about all these concrete issues, concrete harms and disaffections and effect, effect, forms of effectiveness by pollution, we can go beyond the kind of uh, quantitative abstract ideas of just transition that are often in play, which is, well, your workers were earning this, or they were in that kind of uh, collective bargain. If you close a harming workplace, they have to get something equivalent, right? And, and then some unions say, we're going to fight economic transition until you provide justice, which means we're going to increase the cost of just transition for you, which means, well, they can create an incentive for for governments or companies not to transition. Uh, the question is like, how do, how do workers and how do unions become protagonists of, of, of transition? And that is by phasing all, all these forms of harms of, uh, of concrete labor. Sorry, I'm just kind of jumping what uh, Tajo Müller said there. Um, in order to understand this, I developed this uh, exercise that I've done with, with workers in, in different businesses, including aviation workers and Ryanair, uh, which is Japanese self-help self di self diagram, Ikigai. Do you know this? Yeah. So, like, it's a kind of, you know, how can you, how can you, basically, it's an exercise, how can you get happy, but actually they're helping you feel miserable because you realize that there are all these things missing in your life, but that can be used critically, right? So, the idea is, if you do what you do, it's something you get a livelihood from. Pay, you get paid for a livelihood that's be more broad. It's, it's something you do well. It's something you want to do, for instance, because you have nice colleagues and you think the world needs it, then you're in a sweet spot, right? You're happy. You're happy not in the sense of like uh, frolicking around, but just you have this kind of solid contentment in your life that you're doing something good, meaningful, uh, et cetera, right? Most people don't do that. Uh, and in order to think about how workers can, not just other workers, but also ourselves, can challenge the way work is going on and can make claims on determining what is produced and how, including what kind of education is produced and how, we need to think about the ways that we hate work or that work doesn't satisfy our basic needs. Okay? Uh, so, 
different conditions of uh, disaffection in batch jobs uh, could be. Um, like, uh, so we need to degrowth employment in toxic industries. And um, we need to uh, ensure, sorry, I'm not, I'm not sure what I did here. Let me just think about what, what I actually did here. Uh, ah, different ways of, of kind of pressing ourselves and others in to face our own disaffections, not to lie to ourselves that this is all fine, um, is that we have to face the necessity of degrowing employment in toxic industries. And we just have to also make that happen. We uh, have to make clear that there will be a redundancy of skill and there will have to be a redundancy of certain skills and, and that that is a pressure to retrain. We have to, um, to start to no longer give each other recognition uh, or respect for doing work that we recognize as harmful. And we have to create awareness of the harmful character of the work. That's not enough because then you're just unhappy, right? It's just miserable. Um, um, and, and, and people attach to the work in different ways, like the miners in the coal mines of, of East, uh, East and West Germany. Uh, they are really proud and attached and dependent on the work in coal mines. And here's an Nederlandic uh, activist. Uh, I spent hours and days talking to miners in Western East Germany. They fucking hate us with a passion, like people in the, in the climate movement, and with a good reason. The problem with them is not that they work batched jobs. It's that the energies and resources necessary to shift them from active opponents to at least undecideds may be far greater than that required to neutralize their opposition. And basically what he's saying, the activist here, is that some people you're just never going to get on our side. Forget about it. Forget about it. And if you have a, a, a labor movement that takes seriously ecological problematics, you're going to have to say there are parts of the workforce who defend a mode of life that's harmful to all. That's ecological scabbing. Sorry. Like we have, but we have to do something to enable them to change their minds and not be miserable when what they do is abolished. Um, we have to face the reactionary attachment that people have to their work, right? So, uh, I've already mentioned some of these, like, you know, people might uh, really fight for their work because they're simply dependent on it, and they might have a lot of resentment for that work being threatened, and with good, good reason. They might have a lot of pride in their skills. They might refuse to retrain. I'm 60 years old. I trained 40 years ago. You know, I, I, I you know, this is what I know. I, I, I can't, I, I can't afford to retrain or whatever. Uh, workers in the communities also maintain pride in harmful industries, and also they want to do, they decide to do the work because it creates community amongst workers. And some might adopt nihilistic attitudes and selfish carelessness about the consequences of what they do. Um, so. In order to facilitate transition, we can work. All, this gives us a diagram also for what we can work on multidimensionally. Uh, transform production lines, like I mentioned with Lucas Aerospace, um, and develop new kinds of employment locally, uh, fund retraining publicly, and ensure creative redeployment of skills. Also, create conditions for new jobs and non-work activities, a source of meaning, pride, and respect, and community, which I forgot to put, like a community of colleagues or other people you do things with, and create access to restorative, reproductive, and regenerative activities and work. So other things that you can do that are really useful. And this is happening with some, some places with farming that farmers, you go from funding, uh, subsidizing farmers for doing uh, producing as much as possible to doing uh, ecosystem services work, basically, and, 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 and keeping, uh, keeping the land in a certain state that, is, uh, that makes it a carbon sink or whatever. Um, so, what the world needs, what kind of work 
the world needs is a big question. I don't quite have the answer because that's the opposite of bachelor job, right? What the world needs. The way that I approach this is rather than be like, oh, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a sociologist and political ecologist and know what the world needs and let me make a list. I'm like, well, let's work with people to think about what they see as needed and create discussions amongst people who are, who are workers and people in the climate movement, who, by the way, also happen to be workers in most cases or students, future workers. Let's create discussions where we start to think about these questions and raise them in an active way where we become capable of democratically addressing this and addressing it through social struggle as well. So one example is this exercise that I developed, uh, which is basically has the idea that there are three kinds of work. There's the kinds of work that have, have to be maintained and perhaps expanded. It could be like care work, it could be education for, you know, for, for good, certain parts of education. Uh, then kinds of work that have to be transformed, and then certain kinds of work that have to be simply abolished. Different people have very different answers to what belongs where, but it's a really interesting exercise. And if you have people uh, bring together people from who are active in, in, in climate and labor movements, you have really interesting discussions where people have a fight maybe, but also learn a lot from each other and have to face face each other's uh, understandings of the necessity, for instance, to abolish certain kind of mining, and at the same time, the understanding of, of like, okay, what we mine here is actually essential to produce a certain number of goods that have use values, and we need those use values, right? That's a concrete discussion. It's not like, oh, it's good for capital and growth and profitability. It's like, no, we need it for some use values. Therefore, we cannot just abolish the mining of iron ore, because we need iron or whatever, right? So... Um, Strategy. Oh, starting to lose my breath, but I have only eight minutes left, which is a relief. Oh, maybe also for you, I hope not, but <laughs> I would understand. So, uh, I'm, I promised a, a contemporary example of workers fighting for the transformation, and uh, here we have it. The Gikapa N factory in, in Florence that was about to be shut down uh, during uh, parts for auto parts. They occupied the factory uh, two, three years ago and continued running it in opposition to the closure. They, uh, they transitioned production and they connected the canteen to the agroecological movement and, and opened it to the uh, community as a community restaurant as well and built uh, build links to facilitate social and political responses to uh, both local economic decline and to think about what happens uh, in, in situations where there's like heat waves or whatever, what can we do to support each other? And they work with the climate movement to discuss the abolition of fossil fuels. And they're like, we, you know, we want to produce uh, parts for electrical uh, public transportation vehicles and so on. Um, so, why is this valuable as opposed to say, oh, there's a norm which is that people should be more equal. Um, why, why, what's uh, what's strategic about this uh, is that it doesn't discuss, it doesn't start from an abstract norm or fact. It talks to the concrete needs of workers, it and the concrete desires to do something meaningful, something the world needs. And it's based on their experiences and expectations within a community. It's regrounding egalitarianism on practical lived solidarity, fraternity, rather than uh, rather than freedom in the sense of like uh, we should all be uh, free as separated individuals who are somehow equivalent, like these little dots on the line, right? Um, and another thing is that. It shifts from the idea of having a strategic plan, like we need the Green New Deal, to here's the situation, what are the situational potentials of that situation, let's grab them. And it reground, it reground the planning because of course it plans another kind of production, plans, makes uh, plans for how wider economic sectors could be transformed, but it builds that on building collective power with people around them, with other movements, and understanding the tendencies that are relevant to this. 
So uh, rather than pictures of inequality going up and down, let's talk about what are the tendencies that refer to the, to the kind of deeper drivers of inequality and ecological harm. And I see four tendencies that are relevant, and of course, we can, we can enumerate more. There is a tendency towards transition, transition away from, from fossil fuels that's totally insufficient, but it is ongoing to a certain extent, and there's a fight over what that means. There is a tendency, in the sense of a subjective tendency, there's a movement that fights for abolition of fossil fuels. Um, there is a tendency towards more and more disasters, like we saw recently with the floods here. And there's a tendency towards economic decline. Inflation driven by crop failure, for instance, or uh, low productivity in agriculture. Uh, economic decline driven by the growth of uninsurable risk. Like, imagine if, if like, let's say here in Slovenia, this year insurance will pay, I'm guessing, most people. But if you have, if you have these floods every year in Slovenia, your insurance companies are going to crack and if, even if they don't, they're going to refuse to ensure a bunch of people live in, in the bottom of valleys. Or they're going to make it so expensive that most people can't afford an insurance, which means there will be destruction without reconstruction. Or at least without this kind of reconstruction, right? That will require another kind of effort. So there are different... All these tendencies are intertwined in various ways. I'm not going to go into details of this diagram, except to say that... Um, that the more you transition, the, the easier abolition becomes. But at the same time, you have, uh, you have quite problematic uh, tendencies, which is that as it, it decline, economic decline advances, the means to fund a planned transition become less and less. It becomes harder and harder to fund, which means that you have an increase in disaster and... Uh, yeah, and an increased urgency of abolition, but it's an abolition without transition, which is, of course, like, leads to further decline and to create an economic shock if you abolish without transition. So we're heading into a period of, like, quite severe contradictions, and we need to think politically from that starting point um, and to think about the different strategies, the different actors develop with this. This is pretty fast, you know, the way that I made this. So it, we could put it together differently, but this is just to illustrate this way of thinking. That the state is working on transition in a limited way through policy, uh, investment policy, and, and, uh, and also different kinds of regulations and taxations. Uh, but it tends to be limited by the imperative to maintain growth. Why does the state want to maintain growth? It's not because growth is an ideology. This is where degrowth is, folks are often wrong. It's because if you don't have growth, you'll have a decline in taxation. You'll have a decline in employment. You'll have an increase in unpaid loans. You'll have a whole series of economic problems in a capitalist economy that they're not ready to face. Because they're, I mean, both because they're attached to the current order of things, but also because there are not, no popular movements who can facilitate at present that's, that change through an egalitarian movement based on solidarity. Um, so the state is holding off with the, uh, the abolition of fossil fuels for the most part pending transition. Like, we only shut down coal plants when we have the uh, renewable capacity to replace it one to one or more for instance. Um, and then with disasters, you have different forms of relief, but that often end up facilitating disaster capitalism. Um, and then you have the status facing decline with hiking interest rates, austerity, and investment. But like I said, the scope for investment becomes less with decline and, uh, with, of course, with interest rate hikes as well. So then... Um, Capital, they're transitioning insofar as it's profitable. They're not thinking about abolition as, as a name, uh, except like small, cozy micro-capitalists who have no real impact on anything. 
then uh, and then all these tendencies towards decline create increasing te tendency towards crisis in capitalism, which means there will be more situations where industries close, like in Italy, like the GKN, where those are chances to socialize those factories either by workers themselves or by by uh, public authorities. And then there's a the question of what do progressive movements do? Whole bunch of things. And the important thing about this, you know, organizing for a G Green New Deal, not just here's a policy from a think tank, but like fighting for it the way that, that different movements are doing, uh, or building transition towns, or, or uh, doing other kinds of um, uh, transition measures where you can. Um, the fighting for abolition, so you know, just stopping using fossil fuels, which is like few people have the luxury to do that in a radical way. Uh, blockading fossil fuel infrastructure, sabotaging it. Uh, how to blow up a pipeline? Then there's a the disaster. Uh, community solidarity, mutual aid. Um, afterwards, I'd be really curious to hear how what happened with the floods here whether there was any kind of that, because that often creates a situation of a different formation of opinion and a capacity. Locally, if people know each other, support each other, trust each other, they can fight disaster capitalist redevelopment and make sure that the people who lived in an area get the resources to rebuild and so on. Um, and uh, decline, decline this all the classical strategies of unemployed workers organizing, collective care initiatives, reproductive struggles. The key here is, is both that on this side here you have actual solutions, but also the strength of these will determine the direction taken here, right? Uh, if, 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 if the movements are weak, the state will pursue all these strategies in a way that's fully aligned with capitalist strategies. The movements are stronger, the tendency will be to, uh, towards oh, more equality, but <laughs> But that's not the point. The point is, is solidarity, justice, and uh, an end to ecological harm. Um, now, I've gone over time, but I'm going to, since I promised this in the title, I'm going to mention it very quickly. Perspectives for research. I don't know if you heard of transformative science. I just mentioned it not because it's fantastic, but because it's a fantastic way to justify in funding proposals doing something that's politically relevant because it's something they like. German funders and EU funders, they, they pick that up as a little bit as a buzzword. I prefer to talk about co-research, militant research, workers' inquiries, and a bunch of other things. Another thing we can do is to move from comparative research to connected research. Don't compare the problem over here with the problem over there. Connect the people in those two locations so they can work together and learn from each other. Why not? Make an experiment, see what happens when they get into conversation. Not just what are they already thinking, but what are they capable of thinking when they discuss things together, right? Have a science production that is creative, that is productive. Um, produce knowledge with movements, knowledge that's relevant to movements. Channel funding ethically and strategically, which means if you have a conference, don't have it in a big fucking hotel. If you can have it in a space that's built by social movements and you help fund that space. Easy. Really easy. Um, build social science spin-offs. A lot of research projects, they have like funding for three to five years, two years maybe. Build a nice website, blah, blah, blah. Lots of progressive stuff. Funding ends, boom, website gone, right? Why? So like in the research project that I'm in, we just said, okay, let's build our own website autonomously from the project, and we build a social movement school. And we put stuff we do in the project on that website. It's a social science spin-off, and they do that in the STEM subjects all the damn time, and they make a private profit. We don't, but we have something that has continuity and autonomy in the future, something that's of some use, uh, great or small, whatever it is, probably small. but. <laughs> But you know what I mean. Another thing is to make your, your research available. Don't do, if, if you can, I mean, sometimes you have to do interviews that are uh, anonymous, 
safely put in your hard drive. But sometimes you just talk about people, about what is, what is, what are the problems you're facing? What are you doing? What can people learn from that? Make a fucking podcast. Don't put the interview on your hard drive. Make a podcast so other people can, can, can listen to it and proactively share that podcast with people in other movements in the same country or in other, in other countries so they can learn from each other and connect. So, just some perspectives that are based on, on, on what I've been doing, and I would love to hear more suggestions from the audience. Yeah, and this is me. I'm just putting it here because uh, being an academic worker is a condition of uh, constantly threatening unemployment. So if there are any professors in the room who want to hire me in two years when my funding runs out, this is who I am. Uh, and thank you.